was quite nicely done. And, they, and it's very, very accurate because everything that goes on in this broadcast matches up exactly to the official 1908 uh, report, which I read. And so it was uh, published in the BBC at the 100th anniversary. And we're just going to take a look at about five minutes of part um, four. Lined up on the inside was Carpenter of America, then Hallowell, then Robbins, and then Taylor on the outside. Carpenter on the inside lane flew past, followed by Haswell, Robbins, and Taylor on the outside. Carpenter on the inside at that point, Hallowell was beginning to make a move for the finish, and Hallowell began to drift. On, on further on the outside to try and get past Carpenter, but Carpenter just ran further and further and further wide. And at the end of it, the British officials, who were always aware that three Americans against one Britain might be, because of the rivalries, might be a bit of a problem, they snipped the tape and re called the race void. Carpenter crossed the line first, and Hardwell just gave up and stopped. I shall never forget, as long as I live, the scene during the 400 meter race. The public had already been influenced against the Americans, and the judges, taking a signal from the same man on the field, threw up their hands, broke the tape, and declared the race off before they knew what had happened, when they were yards away. Carpenter's elbow undoubtedly touched my chest, but as I moved outwards to pass him, he did likewise, keeping his right arm in front of me. But in this manner, he bored me across clear two-thirds of the track and entirely stopped my run. As I was endeavoring to pass him, I was way up to his shoulder, to say that I could have come up on the inside is absurd. I was too close from halfway around the bend to have done so. And indeed, to have done so would have meant chopping my stride and cost me two to four yards. But John Carpenter had another version of the event. He was running absolutely abreast of me, but he had plenty of room on the outside. He could pass me on the inside if necessary. I do not know of any contact between us at any point during the race. I don't know how I could have been any more fairly run. If Carpenter had fouled Hallswell, the judges should have allowed him to finish. And then if the man at the corner declared a foul, Carpenter could have been disqualified and the race should have gone to the second man who was Robbins. Mind you, I'm not admitting any foul. That's there is so an actual drift to go around the corner to go to the outside of your lane um, it, when, when there are lanes. And in this case, there weren't lanes. Um, and and then it, during that time, this is we're talking about 1908, uh, when the curbs were much, much more narrower than they are now and, and much less forgiving. And so, uh, and according to, to Carpenter's statement, he had a very long stride, and so that was something that he naturally did. But Lord Desborough had clearly stipulated the British rules for the athletes. Well, uh, any competitor jostling or running across or obstructing another competitor so as to impede his progress shall forfeit his right to win the competition. Man shall not be awarded any position or prize that he would otherwise have been entitled to. But as far as the Americans were concerned, this was merely a matter of opinion. Carpenter didn't foul anyone. He simply ran out Hallswell, who in my opinion was quitting as I've seen him quit before. Without hesitation, I say that this race was deliberately taken away from us. The 1908 400 meters has become a source of bitter contention about which there's still no agreement. I don't think the Carpenter should have won the goal. I think that you, know, you have to go with the rules that are in, in place. It may be unfortunate for him that the rules were not explained to him before. Two days later, the judges ordered a rerun of the race. It took a lot of persuading from the AAA officials to get me to run again. It was only after they appealed to my sense of duty that I acquiesced and reluctantly agreed to toe the line. As far as the Americans were concerned, the race had been stolen from them, and there was no reason for a rerun. On the day of the rerun, it was unbelievable. Carbner having been disqualified, the other two Americans decided, because of all the disputes and all the ill feeling that was around, they decided they weren't going to run in the final. So it came to the day, the men's 400 meter final, the day before the marathon, and Wyndham Halswell was there on the track on his own. He just had to run around the track alone, the only ever walkover in Olympic history. And at that point, the games were starting to become almost like warfare. I think it would have been very difficult for Hallswell. It would have been very difficult for any athlete to go out there and run the race alone because now you are basically winning the gold medal by default. Um, and, but at the same time, it would have been very difficult not to. He really had no choice but to go out and run because to not go out there and run would have then been conceding the other side's argument. 
This changed Haswell's view of sport and fair play forever. I've had enough, and I vow to turn my back on the sport. He never ran another competitive race. All right, so, so the 400 meter catastrophe then led into what happened in the, in the marathon. The marathon was one of the most, uh, for, for the spectators, was one of the most looked forward to, anticipated events. And it's really with the young, small Italian, he's just a little bit of a thing, uh, Dorando Petri, that you have the first international superstar. There was tons and tons of press around this young man, and it was expected that he would win. But here again, the differences between how the Americans approach sport and the way the international community <coughs> uh, approach sport would, would make a huge difference. The Americans were very conscious of what they ate and drank before they would do their marathons, and they were very conscious of what they ate and drank as the marathon was going. And Durando Petrie, for instance, sat down and ate a great big steak before the marathon. <laughs> and it ended up being his undoing. The other person who was favored to do really well was a Canadian, uh, um, a Canadian Indian named Longboat. And he only made it to about halfway through the marathon. And basically, one of the things that happened was that they'd had all this rain for the week before, and then on the day of the marathon, it was hideously hot and humid. And only half of the people even finished. So if you finished this marathon, you were doing really well, because, as I said, half didn't finish. And, and what you can see here in the corner is Louis Tawanama, and this is the winner of the marathon, and there's the statue I was referring to. And when, when the, uh, Johnny Hayes won the marathon, <coughs> the Americans grabbed, got the hold of this kitchen table and paraded <laughs> Hayes clear around the stadium once and then, and, then went, uh, and, and then departed. And basically what happened in this marathon was when Petrie got into the stadium, he was almost ready to pass out and he staggers and and they were actually the officials were actually afraid that he was like having a heart attack and he and he comes into the stadium and he's running the wrong way like, you're supposed to go you know he's like running the wrong way and he keeps falling down and you'll see it in the footage what what happens and so he was disqualified and then the queen everybody felt so sorry for him for losing this marathon, the Queen had a special trophy made for him as sort of a consolation uh, prize. So we're going to take a look at this 1908 footage. It of course has no sound because this is the, the beginning of uh, movie pictures. And, and this comes out of an archive of the British News Service. And then they had only been in existence for about two years when, when this was done. And I'll kind of talk about it as we go through here. So in this very beginning, this is the queen and the king being seated in their special box. And one of the things to watch for in this footage is you'll you'll be able to see how many spectators there are for a lot of the different events. And so for many of the events, there were very few spectators. One of the things that the newspapers noted is that when Ray Yuri, for instance, did his jumping, the spectators who were there were all booing. The Americans were getting a lot of um, flack, partly because of all of the complaining they had been doing, and then just the rivalry. Now watch to see the water. Did you see the water? And this was another one of the events in which James Sullivan complained because when the Americans would do this, would do this event, they would put, they they would make a hole for their pole to be in when they jumped. So in America, they would make a hole and then put, and the Brits wouldn't let them do it, so they had to just run without their customary placement mark. And so this. Gymnastics segment is it looks pretty standard. Not much has changed here, but you'll note that there's not too many spectators in the back. Here is the running high jump. Ray only did stationary events, the the standing jumps. 
But the incredible amount of rain, here we have the, the winning uh, tug of war between the two different British uh, police teams. As it, see, the spectators have all got their umbrellas. <laughs> there was so much rain on the um, bicycle track that the cyclists were having difficulties because of the puddles of water, and it was actually causing the concrete to, to fail. So that's what's supposed to happen in a tug of war, as opposed to just one tug and over the Americans go. This is an exhibition event, and what you're looking at is the long vault, and normally the long vault is um, nowhere near that high. You can see where it normally would be in terms of height. But even at its regular height, it's an extremely dangerous event. And after one Olympic athlete was injured sometime in the 1960s and then died three months later from the injuries sustained from this event, they completely redesigned this. And here we've got a discus. And there go the cyclists. And, and even the shot putters and the discus and the hammer throwers were having trouble with the, with the water. And the way they would announce results, see the man with the large megaphone? would tell the spectators what the distances were or whatever the results were. And you got some water polo. And I'm going to say a few things about the marathon leading up to the marathon footage. The marathon prior to this had been about 25 miles long. This is the, when it's changed to 26 miles and 365 yards. And that's because the British wanted the marathon to start in front of the king's house, basically, and then end in front of... The, the King's Stadium booth, which meant that they had extra yardage because they had to go around the stadium. And essentially the marathon ended up being a run through the history of the British Empire because of all of the special places that the runners had to run by. The streets were lined. It's estimated that um, about a half a million people watched this marathon. When, when the footage starts, you'll see how deep all the spectators are, and they're on roofs and balconies, and, and even, even the prisoners in the old prison, when the marathon went by the prison, were allowed to watch it. Here you've got one of the few events that the women were allowed to participate in, and look how windy it is. The wind was blowing about 20 miles an hour when they were trying to do these particular uh, events, and so it threw off all the shooting and archery. When the marathon uh, footage starts, you'll also notice that each runner, here's the start of the marathon, each runner, once they're, they get some distance between them, has a bicyclist who's their pace setter that runs along, that rides alongside them, and then if they need something, like one guy drank champagne and didn't make the last two miles. He was not American. And one of the uh, reasons that Lewis Tawanama didn't finish higher was that he'd only been in, um, in amongst English-speaking people for about a year, and his English wasn't terribly good, and apparently this miscommunication between his pace setter and, and himself, he didn't understand what the, what the uh, guy was telling him. Yeah, here comes, here comes Peter, and he's going the wrong way, and he's about to pass out. And he does collapse. And 
And he's helped up. And this happened, I think, three or four times. And so, of course, he's disqualified. Was he the first one coming into the state? Yes, yeah. yes. And, and while he's, you know, collapsing and stuff, then pretty soon Johnny Hayes comes. And Johnny Hayes said later that um, all that work he'd done as a youngster in his father's bakery helped him with this heat. And he's like, yeah, this is nothing. <laughs> He was a clerk in Bloomingdale's at the time that he ran this race. <laughs> and there he goes. <laughs> and see, there's the diplomas. And there's Ray Yuri. Oh, yeah. Right there. With his trademark black socks. <laughs> I would like to conclude by talking about three of the uh, participants in this 1908 Olympics whose stories really uh, interested and motivated me. And you have John Baxter Taylor, Louis Tawanama, and Ray Yuri. Ray Yuri at the time period had the most gold medals ever. He had 10. Dr. John Baxter Taylor was the first African-American to uh, win a gold medal. There had been some African-American silver medalists in 1904 in track and field, but he's the first gold medalist, and Louis Tawanama is the first Native American to represent the United States in an Olympics Games. This is a, the earliest picture that I could find on the Internet of John Baxter Taylor, probably taken either in high school or Brown Prep, when he was there, judging by how young he looks. He was a really good track and field star even before he got to the University of Pennsylvania. According to the city directories of Philadelphia, his father was a Pullman porter, and he had an eight and a half foot long stride when he was running. He had health problems his senior year, he had a hernia, and the doctors wanted him to be really careful. And, you know, he, he was invited by the Irish American Athletic Club to participate on the American team and so he, he did participate. But he had a lot of troubles with uh, respiratory, maybe allergies, when uh, he was in London and so his times were, were off of what everybody expected him to do. No, nevertheless, he was one of the four people who, who won a gold medal in the um, relay race. And I want you to look at this picture really carefully and, um, and notice a few things. Notice how everybody is seated very, they're, they've all, they're all holding themselves very straight, except for one person, this guy, who's making sure that his shoulders don't touch, his elbows don't touch, and his knees don't touch. And this fellow's making sure that he's got a lot of physical space away from John Taylor, too. In contrast, when Taylor is with the Irish American Athletic Association, his team member here has his hand on his shoulder and everybody is standing close together. And here, the first time I saw this photograph, what I noticed was, look how comfortable Ray Yuri is sitting between those two people. So the official death certificate of Dr. John Baxter Taylor lists his cause of death as peritonitis. He had uh, perforation of the intestine and complications of typhoid pneumonia as well. And when he died, his funeral was attended by thousands of people. He was very, very popular. When he had run in Celtic Park, the Irish Americans all came out and, and uh, cheered him on. They always had huge, huge numbers of fans in the stadium. And four different pastors spoke at his funeral, and a number of uh, carriages accompanied his, uh, his body to, to the graveyard. The acting president of the 1908 Olympic team had this to say in a letter that he wrote to Dr. Taylor's parents. It is far more as the man that John Taylor made his mark, quite unostentatious, 
Genial, kindly, the fleet-footed, far-famed Pennsylvania athlete was beloved wherever known, and as a beacon light of his race, his example of achievement in athletics, scholarship, and manhood will never wane, if indeed it is not destined to form with that of Booker T. Washington. Louis Tuanama is our second profile in courage. Born on the second Mesa in Arizona in 1879, he was at the Carlisle Indian Industrial School in Pennsylvania from 1907 to 1912. He's a very small person. Um, he's only as tall as I am, five, five foot four, and he only weighed 115 pounds. And the, the, I don't know how familiar you are with the Hopi religion, but they have, they have when, when they need to give uh, service to the rain gods, they send out the runners. So there'll, there'll be certain people from the Mesa that are, that are the runners, and their job is to go out and get the rain gods and then run them back to the Mesa. So they do a lot of running. <laughs> so, so Lewis didn't find it particularly unusual uh, to, be, to be doing these track and field events, and when he missed his train for one track and field event... No problem. He just ran 18 miles to the site and placed second uh, in the two-mile race. And there's lots of witnesses to that. that that's, that's not a nice Olympic myth or anything. He was a member of the 1908 and the 1912 Olympic teams. He didn't medal in the 1908 uh, um, Olympics. He was having trouble with his feet and his knees, but he did get a silver in the 1912. And a year after the 1908 Olympics, he set a world record, so he was the fastest 10-miler in the world. And in 1952, they picked 22 of the greatest track and field Olympic champions, and Lewis had this to say about the New York City view from the Empire State Building when um, he was given the tourist you know, tour, and he just looked out over the vista of New York and said, not enough land for sheep, and didn't have much else to say. <laughs> So Lewis was essentially a prisoner of war. Um, the, the, there were 11 young men. He was 30 at the time that, this, that, that he was running. And there were 11 young men, Hopi men, who were designated by the government as being troublesome, which basically meant they weren't doing what the white men wanted them to do. It wasn't like they were getting into tons of trouble. They just weren't cooperating. Most of them were sort of refusing Christian indoctrination. And so they were considered prisoners of war, and they were sent to the Carlisle School. And even when, when Lewis was winning track and field awards for the, for the Carlisle School, when you go back and read what the head of the school had to say, the head of the school really used this kind of language. It is 1907 that Lewis was a trophy of colonization. You know, he's a good example of what happens when you send troublesome Indians off to a school and then, you know, they get, to, they get their hair cut and they wear the right kind of clothes and they get educated and they speak English. But when he went back to the Hopi Nation, he went right back to sheep farming and uh, growing corn and doing all the things that, that uh, his family did. And he didn't do any running. He wasn't interested in participating in the white man's sport anymore. But he was constantly teased by the other Hopi Indians because there were so many people who were faster than he was. And they <laughs> delighted in challenging him to a race and then beating him, even if they were half, you know, twice his age. And he died in his 90s in 1969. He had walked to a religious event, and he was walking home and uh, lost his footing and, and fell. But five years later, the honorary Tawanama foot races were, were started on the Mesa, and they continue to this day. One thing I want you to notice here, this is the Carlisle uh, track and field team, and this young man is Jim Thorpe. So Jim Thorpe and uh, Lewis were teammates in the 1912 Olympics. And, and you may know that Jim Thorpe was here in the Lafayette area briefly because he was a member of the Pine Village football team. In that brief period of time that the Native Americans in, in America had their own professional football league. So reflecting on Tawanama's accomplishments, Teddy Roosevelt was um, quite proud of the fact that uh, Lewis was representing America 
in, in London. There's a picture on the back table of the welcome that President Roosevelt hosted for all of the American athletes at his home in New York. And he was very happy when, when he was introduced to Lewis. He said, this is one of the originals. He's a fine Indian. In 1908, you know, so it wouldn't be the nicest thing to say now, but it was then. And the Carlisle coach, um, Glenn Warner, had to say of Lewis, the little Hopi is the greatest amateur runner in this country and probably in the world for distances from 12 to 20 miles. And everyone knows him, admires his gameness and the modest and unassuming way in which he takes his victories. He is the easiest athlete to train that I have ever handled because he has no bad habits, follows instructions, and never shirks practice. And a Hopi High School track coach has noted, this is from just a couple of years ago, Tawanama is a cultural hero to all Hopi, but especially to young runners. And the tribal chairman, Ivan Sidney, said, when we recall Tawanama, we're re-emphasizing running as part of our identity. It's a source of pride, and it provides a sense of unity, and we can't afford to forget. <laughs>